This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 688, recorded on December 2nd, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, it's a cloudy day, 39 Fahrenheit, 4 Celsius. Um, another good day to be inside doing podcasts and then going to the lab. Also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's sunny, 36 Fahrenheit, 4 Celsius. Pretty nice day. Happy birthday, Kathy. Thanks. Happy it's birthday, yesterday. Yeah. Yes, happy birthday. <laughs> and, yeah, December yesterday. 1. That's a good birthday. It and is. from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. 57 degrees, cloudy um, Monday night. That's the night before last. It froze here in Austin, Texas. <laughs> it's down to, down to 28 degrees, and our garden looks like somebody slung a bunch of cooked spinach all over the place. We're going to have to clean that up, so... Yeah, here it's winter. It's six degrees Celsius. We're in the last month of 2020, the year I had said last December would be a great year just because of 2020 is such a cool number and it's turned out to be a shit show. So hopefully next year will be better. Well, just think we'll all be able to talk about hindsight 2020, you know, when it's behind us. <laughs> what a great episode title for some point at some point, right? Yeah. Yep. Wow. That's very good. Yes. I, I was talking to my family. Um, one of the big things I had wanted last year at Christmas time were different things for travel, um, which have been incredibly <laughs> unuseful this year. Um, and so I've been trying to figure out what I absolutely do not want to jinx um, by yeah. asking for it for Christmas this year. Yeah. In 2019, I traveled so much that I got platinum status on united which is great and i haven't stepped in a plane <laughs> i just went to columbus ohio in february it's like one hour flight right nothing but that's fine i don't know i'm gonna do much traveling next year either I, I i have a booking in zurich in october i said i'm not going if i'm not vaccinated and they agree and they said they would put it in april 2022 we have some news for you uh, the UK has granted an emergency use authorization for Pfizer's mRNA vaccine, who, the results which we talked about uh, last week. And so they're the first Western nation, yeah, I guess, because Russia and China have licensed some vaccines without phase three trials or some funny licensing. I don't know what's going on there. So 800,000 doses next week would be available for health care workers. So what happened in the UK is they have a medicines and healthcare products regulatory agency and they fast tracked this review you know they actually depend on on the company data they don't get the data and evaluate it themselves they say to the company is this okay and the company says yes and they say okay we'll do it cuz here in the US the FDA actually outside advisors to the FDA um, are going to meet on December 10th and they go over the data and decide and pull off it as a member of that committee. What's the name of that committee? Is that ACIP or is it something else? Do you know? I, I think it's... I don't know. No, I think ACIP is once they're licensed. Yeah. Well, we'll get letters. I think, or we can look it up. <laughs> uh, I think once they're licensed, ACIP determines like who should get it and how often and you know, or whatever, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, but yeah. it's an outside yeah. agency of the FDA, yes. right? Yeah, so, ACIP here. It says the FDA, oh, the FDA licenses, then ACIP uh, develops recommendations. That's right. So they do recommendations. Right. So um, I believe that the, so the Pfizer meeting is on the 10th and the Moderna meeting is on the 17th. And as far as I know, they are both um, going to be uh, available to watch for the public on video. <laughs> uh, so cool. I may at least have some of it on in the background to hear some of the data uh, for myself and see what types of data they actually present. C-SPAN for vaccines. Exactly. <laughs> wow. That's how you know I'm a total nerd. 
-hmm. That could be cool. That could be cool to watch. But there's something else coming up. Oh, oh Tony Fauci is giving a grand rounds at Columbia next week. I thought I might Ooh. watch that. That those can mm -hmm. always be fun. So there you go. That's pretty cool. Now, uh, the ACIP has come up with recommendations to the CDC about who should be vaccinated first in the U.S. The CDC doesn't have to accept these, but they probably will. So the ACIP, I believe that's the committee that Paul Offit and others are on. Could be wrong. But uh, so who's first? Residents and employees of nursing homes and such facilities, the first to receive them along with healthcare workers who are especially at risk of, at being exposed. So none of us on this podcast <laughs> fall into that category. <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing a podcast. Uh, the next group will be essential workers, which is like 85 million people. And this includes teachers, people who work in schools, emergency responders, police officers, grocery workers, corrections officers, public transit, anybody who has to work, can't, has to leave home. So again, none of us. <laughs> I've had people ask whether college professors fall under teachers. Um, but I'm guessing probably not. No, because we are all mo mainly teaching remotely, right? Right. If it was a lab course that really had to be taught in person, then that might be different. And there are such courses. I'm teaching one of those in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> and then after essential workers, they're leaning towards recommending adults with medical conditions like diabetes or obesity and everyone over 65. So now we have three people on this podcast who might be <laughs> in that group, but I don't know. I'm willing to step aside. I don't mind. Yeah, I can wait. Uh, I can wait. Not that I'm, I do. I'm, I'm not at risk. Not that I mistrust the vaccine at all. I just want other people to get it. I'm, yeah. I'm pulled up here in the basement uh, with me and my guitar, which gently weeps. <laughs> I found a committee that's called the uh, Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee. And that, uh, the link I found was going to be meeting in October to discuss general matter of development authorization and licensure. And that might be something that Rich uh, talked about, the, the details of their, uh, the outcome of that meeting. But uh, I'm still not sure if that's the group that evaluates the vaccine data from the companies and we'll get it sorted out. And then after all these initial groups, all other adults and you can't do people under 18 because they haven't been studied in the clinical trial. And, and Sally Permar had interesting comments about that on immune last week. She said she thought it was just randomly made decision not to test vaccines in people under 18 and there's no basis for it. And she said it should be changed. It's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, no, she feels pretty strongly about the importance of pediatric vaccines and needing to get these vaccines tested in pediatric populations quickly. Now, of course, despite these recommendations, we don't have enough vaccine to <laughs> immunize all these people. Um, they say in the article that I'll link to for a month or two, there's not going to be every, enough vaccine to cover everyone. Pfizer and Moderna can provide an additional 60 to 70 million doses in January. Uh, uh, but if you get two shots, which is what you need, that's enough for 55 million people through the end of January. This year, I think they have, Moderna has 25 million or 20 million, I think, and Pfizer has 50 million. They split it in half. So it's not a lot. Um, and but so, it's a lot more than zero. <clears throat> yeah, it's great. <laughs> And and Dr. Slaoui, is that how you say his name? Slaoui, the vaccine czar. Uh, he said in February, March, production will increase. We may have AstraZeneca J&J &J vaccines on board. And he's expecting more than 150 doses a month in March, April, and May. 150 million a month. Yeah. What did I say? 150 doses? <laughs> you said 150. Yeah. That's not much. Not much. <clears throat> Um, a little more than zero. <laughs> it's uh, so. I mean, in theory, by summer, many people, if all goes well, many people could be vaccinated, right? Yeah. And hopefully, we'll get more data on that. Um, but it's good. It's all good. I wanted to also um, 
Let's do a little summary of Das Coronavirus. Irina. All right, now I have to mention her name. So let me go to the website. The website is microbe.tv slash Das dash coronavirus. Irina Yakutenko. She said, please mention my last name. So she's doing summaries. She's a science writer in Berlin. So episode 66, uh, Drosten was talking about the AstraZeneca vaccine. He said the design of the trials raised many questions. Part of the volunteers were in Brazil, part in England. Half dose, only English volunteers. Observed differences could appear because of genetic differences between Brazilians or British, or it may be associated with less rigorous procedures in Brazil where it could be harder to follow up. Uh, Drosten mentioned that usually one can see a substantial difference in e vaccine efficacy between two doses if they differ something about tenfold. And comparing the results of the two mRNA vaccines, he noted that in absolute numbers of infected people, the difference between 90 and 95% is rather big. If there are 100 persons infected in the placebo group with the 90% efficacy, there would be 10 infected and the 95%, there would be only five, a twofold difference. A significant part of the episode was devoted to the discussion of schools and, and their role in transition this is very interesting. He said, we don't have enough data of good quality to make any reliable conclusions, but there are two incidents he cite. Uh, there's a research result from Saxony, and there's a link for that. Authors took blood specimens from 1,500 school kids and 500 teachers in May and in October and tested for antibodies against the virus. In May, they found 12 kids with antibodies, and in October, 12 kids. Media coverage was unambiguous. These results mean that schools are not significant sources of infection, but Drosten said, Actually, they mean the opposite. During the half year between the first and second analyses, four kids lost their antibodies. That means there were four new infections during the period. In the same time in the general population in Saxony, the incidence rate was 46 per 100,000. That gives 0.92 per 2,000, four times less than in schools, which I guess the press didn't pick up. Hmm. Yeah, so... It mentions that the two specimens were taken in May and in October. Um, I don't know about the school year um, in Germany, but if we saw that in the U.S., you would say, oh, so that's when they were at summer vacation and not in school. Um, you know, that's largely the summer months that happened in between those two uh, testing that's times. That's true. And so I wonder how much time actually those kids were in school uh, during those two mm -hmm. sampling periods. That's a good point. Another study in Bavaria, children and young adults admitted to hospitals. It only 0.53% of them had antibodies against the virus. That's 530 for 100,000 per six months or 22 to 100,000 per week and much more than the general population in Germany in that period. But the media and scientists again wrote that these results may mean that so-called Dunkelziffer literally dark number, unreported cases that go, don't go into statistics is less than it was assumed. In fact, as in the previous example, everything is exactly the opposite. Moreover, the very idea of using hospital screening as a tool to assess antibody prevalence is questionable, as not every hospital performs that constantly, and even those who do make tests not for every single person admitted. So anyway, microbe.tv das, das dash coronavirus. Irina Yakutenko, thank you for doing that. And, you know, we can get insights that we don't have here. By the way, one of the papers, he, he he's accompanied by Sandra Sisnek, and she's on one of the papers we're doing today. All right. I want to talk about two papers which are a little bit different from what we've been talking about. We're going to try and ease everyone into a little hardcore molecular biology, but slowly... <laughs> You know, no face masks today, but well, you should wear them, but we're not going to talk about it because, <laughs> you know, this was our bread and butter in the old days, Psst, molecular biology, and a lot of people liked it. And you can come to like it too. It's neat stuff. All right. So the first paper is, yeah, this is the one with Sandra Cisek. Would you pronounce that Cisek or Cisek, Kathy? It depends what nationality her name comes from. Okay. So I don't know. Neither do I. I like this name. Look at this. Gerbrand J. van der Heden van Noort. Wow. That's a long name. I thought my name yeah. was long. This is uh, an article in Nature. Papain-like protease regulates SARS-CoV-2 viral spread and innate immunity. 
and this is from a number of groups throughout uh, Germany, which, you know, go to University of Frankfurt and many others and want to mention them. Even though in the and old, at least one from the Netherlands. Netherlands. Um, and as I said, Sandra Shisek, who's with Christian Drosten. Um, and this is interesting because it is about something we really haven't talked about too much. Now, and I want to show a picture. Let's see if I can get this to work here. I go to uh, media. No, I don't have to do that. Here, there's a picture. And I have to do, what is it called again? Uh, Spotlight. Spotlight. Spotlight for everyone. Does that, everybody sees that? Yes. It's for me. You see my arrows too? Can you see that? Uh, no. No, okay. I do not see the arrows. Okay, I guess I'd sure. have to do it. Anyway, so this is a diagram at the top of the SARS-CoV-2 genome. You can kind of see uh, at the left is the beginning of the RNA. The C means cap. It's a little unusual nucleotide at the five prime end of the RNA. And, this, and the whole thing is about 30,000 bases long. And all those boxes are parts that code for proteins. So you can see there's some with weird names like ORF1A and ORF1B, open reading frame. Um, and then there's S, the famous S spike protein <laughs> reading frame. And then a lot of smaller ones downstream, which we really haven't talked too much about, although we will a little bit in the next paper. Now, all the proteins from spike onward, those are produced by translation of mRNAs. They're called subgenomic mRNAs because they're shorter than the viral genome, right? See, they're all at the bottom right there, like spike and ORF3A, E, M, et cetera. There's N in green, the nucleocapsid protein. But <clears throat> the first thir two thirds or so of the genome, this part that encodes ORF1A and ORF1B, these are long proteins and they're, they're translated actually as either ORF1A or a fusion of ORF1A and, and B. And um, they have to be cut to make littler, smaller protein, littler, great caulking, Vincent, littler protein, smaller proteins <laughs> like NSP12, uh, PL Pro, which will come up today, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and other proteins. These are all cut by enzymes called, well, proteases, some people call them proteinases. I don't know. Does anyone on this uh, Zoom call them proteinases? Um, no. If you're, um, <laughs> I can't think of the word, uh, picky, <laughs> uh, there is a difference. Yeah. Ooh. W what is that? I'm looking it up. Uh, Bert <laughs> Semler could tell us in a heartbeat. Yeah, Wimmer used to use proteinase all the time. All, all I know is that sometimes in experiments I use proteinase K. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I am called them proteases. Well, either way, these are enzymes. You know what an enzyme is, right? You know, enzymes are what are in your stomach to digest this, the things you eat. But these are enzymes that are actually encoded in the viral genome that cut up these longer proteins. There are two of them, PL and 3CL. And those are the topics of uh, the first paper. Uh, the, one of them is the topic of the first paper. So that's what the protease does. It cuts up these proteins. And many virus genomes encode proteases. Of course, our genome encodes lots of proteases, like trypsin and many others. Uh, but um, viral genomes do, and these often cut both virus and cellular proteins. All right, let's get away from the picture because now you get this. You get this idea. <laughs> And I have to unpin myself. Let me get myself unpinned here. Also, if you want to have an explanation of how these RNAs are generated, if you go back to um, uh, Susan Weiss's, uh, there's a lecture that she gave, but she also talked about it on the TWIV, but we linked to her lecture and that's an outstanding example of that. And I just wanted to remind people that when a word ends in ACE, A-S-E in science, the first part of the word is what that enzyme is acting on. So a proteinase or a protease implies that the enzyme is acting on a protein. And I, I'm still trying to find a good explanation of the difference between the two. I used to use proteinase all the time because Eckhard Wimmer, who, who Bert Semler worked with, used to 
say proteinase, and I kind of liked it. It was precise. And then I got yelled at not too long ago. For, and I stopped. Well, it's interesting because in that cartoon that you just showed, they call the PL one a proteinase, and they call the other one a protease. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I presume that whoever drew the cartoon knows the difference, which Kathy is oh, really found, furiously trying to figure <laughs> out. I, f I found one thing which sort of resonates, but it also introduces the word peptidase. Oh. Which, <laughs> yeah. But it says that proteinase is synonymous with endopeptidase, and proteases hmm. simply degrade proteins by hydrolysis of peptide bonds. So there are two kinds of proteases, one of which is the proteinase, mm -hmm. I think. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, there's, there are two encoded in the SARS coronavirus genome. All these viruses encode them. So we have M-PRO, or M stands for main, which is also called 3CL-PRO or non-structural protein 5, NSP5. That's the name of the protein encoded in the genome. And then the other one is the papain-like protease, PL-PRO or NSP3. And I, I just, this reminded me, years ago in New York City, on 86th Street and Lexington Avenue, there was a juice bar that sold juice from either papaya or pineapple. And there was, it was advertised as helping your digestion. Feel badly, come have a glass of papaya juice. And the reason, one of the reasons is they have these enzymes. Papaya has papain and pineapples have bro bromelain <laughs> that help digest. I, I, and I love that because when I started working in the lab, we worked with these proteases and I would walk down the street and see these uh, stores selling them. So this one. There was, there was a time, I don't know that it still <laughs> happens, when uh, uh, laundry detergents used to be, uh, contain proteases. They still uh, do. Uh, oh, they yeah. still well, do? They stain lifters. Okay. Stain lifters. And the important thing to know about, uh, for instance, pineapple in cooking mm. is that um, if, you, if you cook the pineapple or you use canned pineapple, the uh, protease is inactivated. But if you ever try huh. to make a dessert or something with gelatin and you use fresh pineapple, it will never set up. Because the proteinase <laughs> in the fresh pineapple is active and digests the gelatin protein. Cool. Holy cow. Yeah. That ought cool. to be in Brianne's uh, <laughs> cooking chemistry book, right? I have to it remember probably that. probably would anymore. be. I have several cooking chemistry books. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it's in there. Yeah. Anyway, so when you say a protease is a papain-like protease or a, you know, bromelain, it means that the overall structure of the enzyme is similar between the, they have a similar active site. There's a part of the protein where the substrate, the protein enters and it's cleaved and they're similar. And, and you know, that's what it means. And uh, so with this PL Pro, one of the two proteases of, encoded in the SARS-CoV-2 genome is a papain-like protease. And again, these are this is needed. Uh, these proteases are needed to cleave that those long precursors to make all the proteins that work because you can't. They don't work as a precursor. This is a cool strategy for this genome. So half the two thirds of the genome makes what we call a polyprotein which is cleaved by virus proteinases. And then the other third is individual proteins are made by individual mRNAs, translation of individual mRNAs. It's kind of interesting because some viruses have only one strategy, making subgenomic mRNAs, and others have only polyproteins, like my favorite virus, poliovirus. Makes one long polyprotein encoding the whole genome, and it's chopped up by two viral proteinases. So that's the background there. So in this paper, they're looking at um, this papain-like protease, PL-PRO. PL stands for papain-like. Now, don't go away, folks. I know you, you're probably thinking, I'm not learning anything about the pandemic here. This is good stuff. <laughs> no, you are. You it's are. Pineapple. Important thing. <laughs> this has some important implications uh, for the um, pandemic. I have heard a couple of talks lately um, that have been talking about the action of what they called PLP, um, what these authors called PL Pro, um, yeah. this protease, and how it may impact um, the immune response. And this this paper gets into that. Yes. Um, the one thing that's really it. important is just like Vincent said, these proteases are going to cut up a viral polyprotein, but they also sort of on the side are cutting up some host proteins. 
Yeah, that's right. Um, so their first job you can think of is cutting up the viral proteins, but they also will sometimes cut host proteins in order to mess with the host immune response. Yeah, most uh, of these. I would also uh, point out for just to sort of tweak people's uh, relevance attention that, as Vincent's already mentioned, this strategy of cleaving polypept or polyproteins into individual proteins is used by a number of viruses, including HIV. Mm -hmm. And some of the uh, antiviral drugs that are used to treat HIV are protease inhibitors, okay? So drugs that stop the protease from working and uh, as a consequence, stop the virus. So this becomes very relevant. A very big part of this paper is figuring out what cell proteins are cleaved by this protease, all right? And there, <clears throat> there are two that we have to introduce. Um, one is called ubiquitin, ubiquitin, and the other is ISG-15. They're, they're very similar. So ISG-15 is called a ubiquitin-like protein. They're short proteins, less than 100 amino acids long, mm -hmm. and they're typically linked to other proteins in the cell in some cases, to improve their function. In some cases, to say, we don't need this protein anymore. It's kind of a target for degradation. And, and you know, one of those is the famous proteasome, the garbage disposal of the cell, which, was well, it's not all garbage, but, you know, as, as Brianna said, a lot of proteins are chopped up into the peptides that are displayed on MHC in the proteasome. And often, if you get an ISG, if you get a ubiquitin, put on your protein that you get sent to the proteasome. It's like a marker, right? So these are these are modifying uh, what proteins do is as we'll see in a moment, some uh, some immune, some proteins in, involved in immune reactions require these modifications for activity, but it's not always that the case. Sometimes they target proteins when you don't need them anymore in the cell. You want to turn them over, put on ubiquitin. You can and also- Go ahead. Uh, you can also put on, especially ISG-15, as a something that can go on viral proteins to mess up their ability to act. Um, so yeah. I sometimes think of ISG-15 as sort of like a little sticky note that goes on viral proteins and blocks their ability to work. Right. Um, and uh, ubiquitin is uh, quite often uh, added as uh, an uh, a multimer of ubiquitin. So you get long chains of ubiquitin. And as I look at the structure and as it's described in the paper, ISG-15 looks kind of like a ubiquitin dimer, okay, as if it's already starting with two ubiquitins together. Yes. If if people are wondering, ubiquitin has been found in, was found in many cell types and it was involved in many processes and it was in fact a protein that was ubiquitous um, mm -hmm. and found everywhere. Hence the name, indeed. Now they compare this PL Pro from SARS-CoV-2 with the SARS-CoV PL Pro, right? So both genomes encode this protease, 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 excuse me. They compare what cellular proteins and they do a series of lovely experiments, which I won't get into. Uh, they're very cool and amazing tech, but the, they just want to know what these proteases are cleaving. And the bottom line is, the two proteases from SARS and SARS-CoV-2 are slightly different in their substrate preferences. So a substrate is something that the protease is cleaving, right? So uh, basically, uh, SARS-CoV uh, has a preference for ubiquitin. It will it likes to cleave ubiquitin off of cellular proteins, and SARS-CoV-2 PO prefers to cleave ISG-15. They both will cleave the others, so SARS-CoV protease will also cleave off uh, ISG-15, but less efficiently than it cleaves off ubiquitin, and inversely for SARS-CoV-2 PL Pro. I don't know if we've mentioned this yet, but uh, the designation ISG stands for interferon-stimulated gene, okay? So just by the name, you know that this is a protein that's implicated in... Uh, the innate immune response to viruses. It's yes. a virus infects a cell, interferon happens, interferon acts, and you get uh, genes that are turned on because of interferon action, including ISG-15 that, uh, you know, functions as part of the cell initially trying to get rid of the virus. So they do a series of experiments to show that <clears throat> this, this is 
this substrate preference is in fact correct, all different methods. Uh, they even solve the structures of the structure of SARS-CoV-2 PL Pro together with ISG-15 so they can see where the ISG-15 is binding at the active site. They can identify amino acids that they think are important for modifying that. They can compare the SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2 structures to see what amino acids are making this slight difference in substrate uh, specificity. And it's all lovely stuff, but the part I want to jump to is, is has the biology now. And what does this mean that these proteases are cleaving ISG15 off of proteins or um, ubiquitin off of protein? And to do this, they do some interesting experiments. They've, they have catalytically inactive versions of uh, these proteases that they can throw into cells and see what, what's different when you inactivate the ability of these proteases to cleave. And essentially they find that there's an effect on um, the interferon system. And so both uh, ISG15 and uh, ubiquitin are, I guess it's ISG15 only, is ubiquitin also needed for activity of these signaling pathways? I don't remember. Let's take I a look. I would imagine there has to be some place yeah. where ubiquitin is important. Um, I don't, can't but name ISG it off the top of my head, but I would, I would think there must be. So here's a here's a, actually an image from the paper. And for those of you listening, you know, we'll link to these images in the show notes. Although I know you can't listen when you drive, but we'll try and describe them. So here's SARS-CoV-2 infecting a cell. You know, at some point, its RNA is in the cytosol because it has to be translated, and that gets sensed by proteins that are part of the innate immune system that say, hey, there's RNA in the cytoplasm. It doesn't belong there. It's probably a virus. Let's make an interferon response. And there are a whole bunch of sensors, and one of them shown on this side is, is MDA5, uh, which initiates a series of phosphorylation reactions, adding phosphate to various protein. The, the end result, all the way at the bottom here, this protein uh, IRF3 uh, gets phosphorylated, it's dimerized and then goes in the nucleus and turns on the antiviral genes like interferons and, and others. And that requires ISG15. So ISG15 modification of IRF3 is essential for this activity. And they can see that the protease removes ISG15 from IRF3 and dampens the interferon response which is very cool, right? So not only is this protease involved in chopping the viral proteins to make them work, but it's also blocking innate responses of the cell. Right. And so this is why I found this paper so interesting. Um, basically, what it's showing us is that this protein, um, PL Pro, is inhibiting this aspect of the innate immune response um, in order to kind of help the virus hide a little bit and make less interferon. Um, and interferon is important for combating this virus. And so um, this is sort of a way that the uh, SARS-CoV-2 is combating um, and trying to hide from the immune system. But what's also important is that the protease from SARS-CoV-1 isn't as good at this particular activity, isn't as good at avoiding the interferon response. And so here uh, we might have some reasons why there are differences in um, what happens when people are infected with SARS-CoV-1 versus SARS-CoV-2. Um, so if we understand what this protease is doing, we might understand this disease state a bit more. So the SARS-CoV PL Pro does something different as well. It less effectively removes ISG-15, but it also, you know, it does pretty well at ubiquitin. And apparently this blocks another kind of inflammatory response uh, that the cells make, um, which is the NF-kappa B response. So they're doing slightly different things, which is quite interesting. And I mean, the, the real question here in the end is, oh, is this something that happens in human cells or what does it happen in bat cells? And that would be interesting to look at. You can easily do those experiments, right? Because is, 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 do you need this in a bat cell and so forth? Because that's where these viruses originally came from. Now they have an inhibitor. Sorry, you wanted to say something? Go ahead. I, I was just going to uh, generalize that um, this 
concept of a virus tinkering with uh, the cell to evade the innate immunity. We've talked about it before, but it's worth mentioning here that this is a, you know, this is a big deal. And if you look back at that uh, uh, diagram that you showed initially, uh, Vincent, with the all of the different uh, open reading frames, there's a significant number of those uh, that are not uh, have, do not have familiar designations like S and N and E and that kind of stuff. There's a lot of those. ORF six or seven A, I think it's a big one. ORF seven B. Susan Weiss talked about some of these that are uh, proteins that are specifically designed. Now the protease is doing a dual purpose thing, but a lot of these others are specifically designed to tinker with the innate immune response in the cell. And this is a constant tug of war, and these are finely tuned to the host that they or that they ordinarily grow in. And part of the issue with spillover is that now we're out of tune, <laughs> okay? And maybe the uh, immune uh, innate uh, immune response is not as good as at crushing this and, and, and et cetera. So this is a big deal. Now, th there is an interesting uh, drug in this paper or, or compound, GRL-0617 was developed previously for SARS as an inhibitor. Uh, it was never uh, licensed because it has, uh, it doesn't have enough activity apparently. They say that actually later. Um, but it's a protease inhibitor. It's an inhibitor of PL Pro. So it inhibits SARS CoV PL Pro. And they show in this paper that it also inhibits SARS CoV 2 PL Pro. And it, all these things we've mentioned, the removal of um, ISG 15, the dampening of the innate responses, they're all reversed in the presence of this inhibitor. The, inhibit the inhibitor blocks cleavage of substrates by PL Pro. And it, it allows for a, a more sustained or higher innate response because the, the protease can't do the things that we've just described. And they also show that the drug uh, blocks SARS-CoV-2 replication in cells. They look at you know development of cell killing, cytopathic effect. They look at the um, production of viral RNA. It's inhibited by uh, this this protease. And that adding the protease to virus-infected cells uh, increases the conjugation of ISG15 to IRF3, which we mentioned is important for the innate responses. So it's interesting. So you have a two-fold effect of, of this protease inhibitor. You inhibit processing of viral proteins so the viral genome can't be reproduced. And at the same time, you're kind of boosting the innate response. So it's a two-fold effect. Now, they don't actually – I thought it would be interesting – if they used cells without an interferon system and just looked at the protease, if the effect on the protease and how much that would inhibit in the absence of the interferon effects. And that can easily be done. But that's cool. It's a nice uh, way of using a drug to probe uh, what's going on here. And they say, oh, here, the low potency of GRL-617, uh, we need to develop more potent inhibitors because you'd have to use too much of it to inhibit. But... This could be a, a nice lead. And many people, of course, are looking at protease inhibitors. It's an obvious target, right? You make a, you can easily produce the protein and make an assay and look for inhibitors. So we may have some at some point. And I think these are worth developing because they're going to be future spillovers of new coronaviruses, and we should have some of them ready. So don't stop just because we have a vaccine, right? I didn't look into it, but this uh, group or this collection of people must be you know, long time protease experts, okay, uh, who've who've gotten into this, you know, with the coronavirus thing, because this is really sophisticated experimentation. Yeah, hugely so. And highly and highly specialized. Yeah. There was uh, one thing that I wanted to point out that I think is uh, that drew my attention, and that is they do an experiment where they look to see uh, what other cellular proteins. Uh, this protease interacts with in both a SARS infection and a SARS-CoV-2 infection. And I just wanted to point out that there are many host proteins that this apparently interacts with, some of which 
some subset of which are involved in the immune response. And when, and there are uh, many, many differences between the SARS and uh, SARS protease and the SARS-CoV-2 uh, protease. So it's not as if the virus is going out, in, although it may be quite significant, the virus is going out and picking out this one particular host protein. There are lots of host targets. Um, and this one may be significant. There may be other significant host targets as well. It also makes me think that, you know, a virus infected cell undergoes a lot of changes. And this is one of the reasons. I'd just like to say something, um, a sort of big, broad picture that I talk a lot about in my classes. And that is that to make effective antivirals, we have to target processes that are specific to the virus. We can't easily do things that are going to also hurt the cell and, and be toxic there. And the reason why, you know, this, this flavor of antivirals attacking the protease is important to develop is that, as Vincent pointed out, this kind of, or somebody pointed out, it's, it's already a, a approach used in HIV and other viruses. And it's likely that we're going to need to have multiple targets. So targeting the protease, targeting some other activity of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and, and have some kind of multi-drug uh, regimen, that uh, combination regimen that, that we can give so that we don't get resistance arising. Yeah, the HIV protease inhibitors are a great example of how effective and successful these things can be. They have multiple ones. So, you know, and of course, other inhibitors of other steps. So you can do combination therapy and minimize resistance to these uh, inhibitors. It's really wonderful. And Vincent's talked about this before, about how we really need to have uh, a lot, as much basic research into these sorts of inhibitors, replication inhibitors of all different sorts, so that uh, when so that we're poised for translating that research into therapies when we are confronted with something like a pandemic. I mean, this drug in this paper is a perfect example, right? So they had this inhibitor. It turns out to inhibit SARS-CoV-2, but it's not potent enough. But right. if they had kept developing it after SARS-1, they might have had something more potent. And that might have been able to be used in this outbreak. And, you know, for many reasons, they stopped. It's, oh, the pandemic's over. The SARS pandemic is over. That's it. We're not going to develop any more antivirals. Well, and they probably also couldn't get funding yeah. for it to continue yeah, it. Yeah. So, so, you know, you can't get NIH or whatever the agency is in your company, in your country to fund. Say, oh, they, we don't need this anymore. And the companies won't do it because there's no profit. So who hurts? Who gets hurt in the end? Us. The other paper is uh, in Nature Communications. SARS-CoV-2 genomic and subgenomic RNAs in diagnostic samples are not an indicator of active replication. Uh, this is from Alex Anderson, Chamings, and Raj Bhatta, who are at uh, Deakin University uh, in Australia and University Hospital and Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases. In Geelong, I have to say it, Geelong. They taught me how to say it when I visited I actually visited Geelong, um, which is an interesting place. So it's outside of Melbourne, about an hour outside of Melbourne. And uh, th there is a BSL-234 facility there. And that's where Lin Fa Wang used to work. I went to visit that Geelong. Uh, so that's where this came from. You're going to say something, Rich. No, I wasn't. Uh, so I can hear when people, you know, take in take the intake of breath and are about to speak. And uh, okay. I was probably just go oh, on. <laughs> so let me let me show a picture here to illustrate what we're going to talk about. We go back to the um, the genome expression strategy. Let's spotlight this. So remember the whole genome with all the open reading frames. Uh, two thirds of it is translation translated to two polyproteins that are cleaved by these proteinases that we've talked about. But then, at the right end of a third or so, all these other proteins, spike, nucleocapsid, et cetera, M matrix, they're all translated from individual mRNAs or what what are called subgenomic mRNAs. Now, <clears throat> that's the subject of this paper. 
The subgenomic RNAs, by definition, are only made in infected cells. They are not present in virus particles. As far as we know, the only thing in virus particles is the viral genome, this 30,000 base uh, plus strand of RNA. So, you know, if you see subgenomic RNA, mRNAs, it may be an indication that you have an infected cell. Let me take this spotlight off here and go back to gallery. It's a little inconvenient zoom to have to do all that. But this paper says, no, it's not necessarily true. If you pick up subgenomic RNAs by PCR, it does not necessarily mean you're looking at an infected cell. All right, so this idea arose. So you do PCR, you take a nasopharyngeal swab, you do PCR, and you, know, you can design the primers to amplify any part of the genome. You could design them to just amplify the part of the genome where there's no subgenomic mRNAs, so that only picks up the viral genome. Or you could pick up some smaller ones, like spike you would design to pick up the spike M mRNA or nucleocapsid, whatever you want to do. And the idea arose, as they discussed initially, that um, it's been assumed that if you find subgenomic mRNAs, that means the person is still making infectious virus. That means an infection is still ongoing. And the point of this paper is that that's not true. It's probably not correct. And these subgenomic mRNAs, there's been papers published on this. They've looked for various subgenomic RNAs of all those uh, different ones there in that picture I showed you. You can find them 11 days, 17 days, 22 days after the onset of clinical symptoms, which is a long time. You know, this, this infectious period really, we now know, is, is ending pretty quickly. And so... They say uh, that this, these subgenomic mRNAs are probably not a good marker of replication, even though they're around. So what's going on? And that's the topic of this paper. And <clears throat> they do a very exhaustive study. They have uh, nasopharyngeal samples from a variety of patients. They do deep sequencing. And they say, hey, here are all the mRNAs. We can see them. There are different abundances. And... You know, there's an extensive part of this paper, which is basically mapping all these subgenomic RNAs, saying that you can find them in d diagnostic samples and you can find them by PCR for sure. And the abundance of each one varies not only according to the RNA, but according to when the sample is taken. But the key part, in my view, of this paper is the part where they have this idea, and I haven't introduced this, but let's do that. So when the virus infects the cell and the proteins are made, including the RNA polymerase and other proteins, what, the, what they do is they uh, modify the membranous structure of the cell to form these little vesicles, and that's where viral RNA synthesis occurs. This is a common theme for many RNA viruses, that the virus infection induces membranous vesicle formation, and that's the site of RNA synthesis. And their idea is that these membranous vesicles may be protecting the RNAs, and that's why they're hanging around so long in diagnostic specimens. They're not degrading because the membranes are in some way protecting them. That's their hypothesis. And so and they- sometime, Sometimes these vesicles are completely closed off, but sometimes they're, they're just like an invagination and a yeah. pouch. And so uh, some, when you say vesicle, some people might think of only the, yeah. the completely closed entity, but that doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. And in fact, for some viruses, the RNA is on the surface- like for polio, the vesicles are closed, but the RNA is on the surface. And that may be enough to shield the RNA. And some it's inside, and some of them are open, and some are closed. And of course- Yeah, and theoretically, for, for the evolution of the virus, one possible reason that the virus uses this sort of mechanism is to hide the viral RNAs from the cell, yeah, because otherwise yeah. they would trigger the, the innate immune response and the cells would get rid of them. Yeah, that's, that's one idea. And another idea is that you want to concentrate all the components you need for RNA synthesis in one place rather than having them float around the cytoplasm and have to bump into each other. But And then the other, the other caveat is, or consideration, I should say, you know, when a, in your nasopharynx, as your cells are infected, they're dying, they're breaking open, these membranes are coming out, uh, you know, they could change from the way they are in the cell. They, they could become closed vesicles. You know, we know that when you artificially break up cells in the lab, you know, the ER, which is this long convoluted membrane structure, can fold into vesicles, actually, as the cells break open. And so 
we don't know the form, but their theory is that these membranes are somehow protecting these RNAs, uh, and they can stick around a long time in your nasopharynx, long after the virus uh, infection is gone. So the key experiment is they take two samples. Well, they say one is a good quality sample and one is a poor quality sample that was suspended in water rather than saline. <sighs> Why would you do that? But there you go. <laughs> and then they- you goofed. They goofed. They treat them with a detergent called Triton X100, which is one of my favorite detergent names. It just doesn't that great? Triton X100 it makes you think of- them. I'm not sure it's as cool as MP40. You like MP40? <laughs> MP40 yeah. is and good have too. You ever used, what else? Have you ever used Triton X114? Ooh, yes, I've heard I have. of it though. I have yeah, heard there of you it. go. I've heard yeah. of it, yeah. So Triton X100 will, de will degrade these membranes, will, de will dissolve these membranes basically. And then they say, let's do PCR before and after. And before you can find mRNAs and you treat it with Triton, RNA is degraded. No more vesicles, no more protection. It immediately degrades because these are clinical samples, right? They're full of enzymes that can degrade the RNA. And they also can show that you can centrifuge these samples before detergent treatment and the RNA will go to the bottom of the tube because they're in heavy vesicles. Right? If the RNA were out, it wouldn't be able to centrifuge at a very low speed. And then uh, if you treat them with the detergent, now they don't go to the bottom of the tube anymore. So I think, I mean, that's not the whole paper and it's only two samples, but I think it's a good indication that uh, you can have a signal of mRNA from a patient which does not represent infectious, necessarily infectious virus because the RNA can be protected. So I will say that when I read this paper, um, I was very curious to hear what Vincent was going to have to say about it um, because I wondered uh, whether he would um, want to see assays like a plaque assay to see active replication <laughs> because they have in their title um, that there's no, you know, these are not indicating active replication. And so I wondered how you felt about how they demonstrate active replication here, Vincent. No, they don't, of course. They don't do any plaque assays, right? Um, it would be nice to have done infectivity in these samples and correlate it, right? So they have these two samples where they say there's RNA persisting, but it doesn't mean there's infectious virus. Actually, look, but they don't, unfortunately, which is too bad. And that's, I think this needs to be followed up where they look at more samples and uh, compare infectivity for sure. I was a little disappointed that, uh, as you pointed out, they used so many different methods to show these subgenomic RNAs and their abundances in these samples and so forth. And it's unbalanced relative to then choosing two samples yes. to do the <laughs> membrane studies. Yeah, they should have done more. Uh, yeah, I agree. Or, 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 you know, figure out some other rigorous assay for showing the importance of the membranes, uh, of which I, yeah, I'm I sure agree. there are some. I agree that these are issues, yeah. I just wanted to make one other little uh, technical point so that the audience can feel like they really uh, can know some hard-assed molecular biology <laughs> that they can impress their friends with. And that is, once again, go back to Susan Weiss's lecture, uh, the way these subgenomic RNAs are made, which is really complex and convoluted, results in each of them having a small piece of uh, nucleic acid sequence, RNA, on their extreme left end that comes from the extreme left end of the genome. Okay, they're made ultimately in a discontinuous fashion. So they're in, in a sense all barcoded, okay, with a little piece of sequence at their extreme left end that distinguishes them from genome. And you can actually pick out uh, RNAs that have a little bit of uh, genome sequence and this barcode on the end. And that's what distinguishes these as uh, subgenomic RNAs. Very cool. One more thing I wanted to mention here. There's a bit in the discussion. Well, this is an, a, a result, but in the discussion, they say some samples, in particular those with a high virus load, so in other words, a low CT value, had very few reads mapped to cellular RNA-controlled amplicons. So amplified cellular RNAs. Whereas others, in particular the negative sample and those with a low virus load, had many reads mapped 
to these amplicons. In other words, the primers are not 100% specific for the viral genome. You can have some amplification, especially when the viral load is low or if there's no virus. If you just took a sample from an uninfected person, you might see some amplification. And so I think that's what happened to me when I had my false positive weeks ago, of a CT of uh, you know 35 or so, probably amplified some, if it weren't contamination, I mean, it could also, also be contamination, but it might have amplified some cellular sequence that's homologous. Because if you think about it, the chance that you're going to have some cellular sequence that looks similar enough to a primer, a PCR primer to be amplified, is pretty good. And so that's why if you yeah, get the a- way the, the way the PCR reaction works, once you get a couple of rounds, yeah. okay, then you've got something that can really be uh, amplified like gangbusters, okay? So once it gets rolling, it can really uh, give you a positive. Anyway, so it could be that looking for mRNA does not necessarily mean that you have infectious virus. I thought that was kind of neat. There's a lot of stuff in there that is not we haven't talked about, but I think that's the bottom line, and that's how they do it. All right, let's do uh, some email here. Why don't you take that, uh, Kathy? Okay, so Anne writes, Dear Twib folk, as a non-scientist, I rely on you for a scientific yet somehow entertaining perspective on the pandemic. I'm sure by now you've seen this news that the virus was purportedly widespread in the U.S. in December. I have to interject. The <laughs> paper that we're going to talk about does not show that it was widespread. Okay. This gives rise to several questions on which I hope you can shed light. If there was indeed this level of infection in mid-December, wouldn't we be seeing evident community spread and excess deaths in January and February, especially as we were not wearing masks or physically distancing at all? Two, if there's a question about the specificity of the test that is being done on these blood samples, why not also do a similar test on samples from the same month the prior year to see if what is showing up is normal winter coronaviruses rather than COVID-19? And three, if indeed it was SARS-2, is it possible that it was a less contagious and less virulent variant? It doesn't seem to make sense. Okay, and then uh, as my thanks, here's a limerick. There once was a podcast called TWIB. They put papers and facts through a sieve. Is it true? Is it fake? Is it oil of a snake? If we lap, if we listen, perhaps we will live. Darts <laughs> and I like that. That's awesome. Yeah, really that's nice really memory. good. Yeah. That is good. So uh, I came across this uh, paper another way. Someone uh, sent me a text about it, and I looked up the primary paper, and it's from the Clinical Infectious Disease, and that's a paper a journal of the Infectious Disease Society of America, and. I believe it's open access because I didn't have to do anything special to get it. And it's entitled Serologic Testing of U.S. Blood Donations to Identify SARS-CoV-2 Reactive Antibodies, December 2019 to January 2020. And the first author is Sridhar Basavaraju. And uh, the uh, final two authors are Natalie Thornburg and Susan Stramer, Stramer. And I know Natalie Thornburg uh, she was an undergraduate in the lab of my graduate school roommate. And then I think I first met her when she was at UNC in uh, a virology lab there. And, and she moved to Vanderbilt and is now at the CDC. And so uh, I've kind of followed her for a variety of reasons. Anyway, uh, in this paper, they get samples from uh, American Red Cross blood donations and some of them are from California and Oregon, and those were from December. And then they get some from other states, including Michigan, uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island. Uh, and those are from uh, December 30th to middle of January. And um, let's see, so they don't have anything about whether these donors were PCR positive for any kind of coronavirus. They don't have that kind of data. What they're looking at is antibodies in the serum samples that were collected. And they go through a big explanation of um, how donors uh, can donate blood and what you might get excluded for and so forth. Um, and so uh, they uh, have some caveats to their study, which we'll talk about later, that uh, relate a little bit to the fact that 
these are not from samples that are confirmed to be uh, virus positive by PCR. Uh, and so these specimens were previously archived for potential future studies to identify emerging transfusion transmissible infections, but were repurposed for the present study. So I think that's a really good repurposing of these samples. Um, and so uh, they use first an ELISA assay. So this is an antibody assay uh, for the full length uh, spike protein. So it's a pan IgS ELISA uh, screen and they find some positives and they give the numbers for that. And then they go through and they use some more uh, detailed assays for just either the S1 portion of spike or, um, and the reason for that is because the S2 portion of the spike by my relatively quick reading is the S2 portion is more likely to give you cross reactivity, but they do some pretty rigorous testing to show that the specificity of their assay for SARS-CoV-2 is 99.3% with a very narrow confidence interval, meaning that that's uh, really good. And sensitivity of 96% uh, with also um, a, a pretty good confidence interval. And so in their study, they did find uh, four of, let's see, paired sera from PCR confirmed infections with the common coronaviruses, four of those 42 had um, increasing signals showing that they were active common cold coronavirus infections, but none of them reached the level of detection in their assay uh, for the uh, uh, S1. So they ha so I think that answers at least one of the questions that our listener sent in. So they have good specificity and um, uh, sensitivity. And basically, they go through some other tests. Um, but uh, the, the bottom line results are that there's some evidence that there was uh, a small percentage of blood donations from California, Oregon, and Washington as early as December 13th to 16, um, where they detected the uh, SARS-CoV-2 reactive antibodies. And similarly, they found some in Connecticut, Iowa, Massachusetts, Michigan, et cetera, uh, for the later donations. And uh, they find, uh, although there are more male donors in this set of samples, um, they can still do a, a proportion thing. And they find that there were more males that were seropositive. And that's kind of as you would expect. And then in one of the sets of samples, they were also able to show that the portion, proportion of donors uh, that had reactive antibodies was higher of uh, donors over 40 years old. So um, I just remember having a discussion with at least Vincent, if not others, when we first learned that there was evidence of one of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections occurring on December 1st, 2019, that I remember saying, oh, and I bet it was in the U.S. in December also. And so uh, I think this shows some um, pretty good uh, evidence of that. So uh, they have a couple of the uh, limitations or caveats. So first of all, none of the sera are what you would call a true positive. A true positive is collected from an individual with a positive molecular diagnostic test. So they don't have that. Um, these donations may not be representative of all the blood donors or donations in those states, and so may not be generalizable to the whole uh, population of blood donors and so on. Uh, it can't be determined whether these infections were community or travel associated. Uh, fourth, uh, even with a highly specific test, false positives can occur, um, but again, they talk about the specificity of the uh, pan spike ELISA versus the S1 spike ELISA. And they think it's very unlikely that all of the reactive specimens are false positive. So they really think that um, this is a, a valid study from that standpoint. And so it highlights the uh, value of blood donations 
to uh, look for these kinds of infections. Um, and they point out that blood donations were used previously for population-based studies during the Zika virus epidemic. So uh, now, uh, part of the reason why I'm also interested is because I donate blood at the Red Cross and I often will donate around the end of December. And so I thought, oh, maybe, you know, maybe my blood is in that sample. Mm -hmm. But uh, last year I donated December 16th and the samples from Michigan and so on were from December 30th onward. So, oh, well. I wonder why they didn't uh, try earlier samples because, you know, if you went back a month, two months and you still see the same thing, then I would doubt it's SARS-CoV-2, right? Right. Um, So maybe that's something they're in the process of getting. I I just don't know. Um, So uh, when Anne says, you know, that it was purportedly widespread, I don't think this study shows that it's purportedly widespread. I haven't given you the numbers, but it's on the order of... um, one to three percent of their samples, I think, um, and so uh, it's 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 not that high. Um, if there's a question about the specificity of the test, why not do a similar test on samples from the same month the prior year? And and they could do that, um, but I think that they have pretty carefully shown their specificity, and they and they did uh, use samples that were collected for other things to help them establish their specificity. And I'm not going to be able to find that quickly, but um, it was uh, for blood samples from potential hantavirus positive samples and, and so on. So they, they, they did do that, but maybe not specifically with December and January of 2018. Um, and then um, is it possible that it was a less contagious and less virulent variant? Uh, it doesn't seem to make sense otherwise. And I don't think you have to postulate that it was any less contagious or less virulent. It wasn't particularly uh, widespread at that point and wasn't, you know, being paid attention to. And so I think that uh, that's not going to give us an idea that there's a more virulent variant that arose. I think one of the things that's going on with the pandemic now is that we spent the first six months spreading it all over the place. Okay. <laughs> uh, and now it's really, uh, yeah. it's really blooming. Yep. But it, it takes a while, you know, as, as, as contagious as it is and as transmissible as it is, it takes a while to yeah. spread throughout the country in particular in the rural areas where the population density is lower and people don't move around as much. I mean, this is, as Kathy said, is, If the first case was in China December 1, and that was reported in New England Journal, then it's plausible that some travel brought it here in December. Sure. I would just like to see November, October, September and see, because if you get the same results, then it's not likely SARS-CoV-2. I mean, it could be other things. It could be some other coronavirus that's, you know, infecting people and it's not causing disease that cross-reacts. Who knows? So I think that would be really important to do. And, you know, the the blood, the Red Cross has blood going way back. So it seems to me they could have done that. It's a little intriguing, though. Sure. Mm-hmm. Eric Delwart, are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm sure he's email. on it. I'm sure he's yeah. on it. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Um, Brianne, can you take June's? Sure. June writes, hello, all. Your letter about trolley and ensuing discussion made reference to transfusion with the wrong blood type and red blood cells being lysed. Trolley is not caused by transfusion with blood of incompatible red blood cell type. It is caused by transfusion with plasma, the liquid part of the blood, including the small amounts of plasma in transfused red blood cells and involves white blood cells in HLA type. HLA typing is not done for, done for blood transfusion of any kind. It would be cost and time prohibitive. No one would get the blood they needed in a timely fashion. Here's a description of the etiology of trolley and a link to the FDA information from which I copied this paragraph. The etiology of trolley may be attributable to the presence of anti-HLA and or anti-granulocyte antibodies in the plasma of multiparous females or donors who have received previous transfusions. Trolley recipients have no specific demographics such as age, gender, or previous transfusion history. 
although trolley does not always occur through transfusion from donors with an anti-HLA or anti-granulocyte antibodies, one or both of these antibody types have been found in 89% of trolley cases. And then she gives a link. I am just a retired high school science teacher who has gone back to my first career in clinical laboratory science and am currently working per diem in a hospital transfusion services laboratory. The hospital where I work has never given a patient the wrong type of blood. It is exceedingly rare to do so in blood banking today. Your discussion of trolley made it sound to the non-blood banker as if transfusion with the wrong type blood happens not infrequently. Please correct this information as soon as possible. Thanks for all you do for virology and immunology, but please stay away from immunohematology. I, do you remember? Did we say this? Uh, we did. Um, I think that we we probably talked about antibodies to the wrong blood type, um, as well as sort of other antibodies to things in the transfusion. Right. I think we probably did leave the impression that trolley was, uh, uh, yeah, a blood type thing. Not right. uh, as is described here. And this is nice to have this correction. Yeah, I think it's very useful to know this. Um, and June is absolutely right that transfusion of the of an incompatible blood type is exceedingly rare. Um, and so I apologize if we gave the a different uh, approach than that or a different and opinion than that. I would also say uh, good on you, June. Uh, I have had friends who have had careers in hospital transfusion services. And that is a tough job, okay? Because not only does it have to be spot on all the time, uh, but you get in situations where uh, 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 a lot of stuff needs to happen very quickly, okay? So it's a stressful, can be a stressful job, I think. I will say though, June, as a high school teacher, you should know that you should not stay away from anything. That's how you learn is to venture into new areas. So we learned now we will not stay away from anything. I hope you were saying it in jest. Well, not only that, but, you know, we <laughs> obviously get into situations where we're talking outside of our expertise and our listeners correct us. It's and that's be. great. It's going to happen, And we right? all learn something. It's always going to ventured into that area, we would not have learned this from June. Yeah, so thank that's you, that point. Exactly right. And we will continue to do so because virology impacts everything. You can't get away from it. Rich, can you take the next one? I was just wondering the other day, <laughs> whatever happened to our small New England town police officer who said her PPE know. was latex gloves and a Glock 22? I don't know. Someone Are asked. You? And, uh, Are you still listening? Because she wanted to know. You know, this was really early on. I know. And she wanted she she couldn't protect herself. Uh, look, so so uh, someone I wrote wonder. in about three months ago and asked the same question, and we said, let us know. I actually, wrote her an email in response and never got a response. So hmm. okay, hmm. maybe she's gone. Maybe All she right. was just a troll. You know, who knows. <laughs> Uh, she was a. Uh, she was. Uh, I don't think so. She was. That was the. That was one of the best letters we've ever had. That was great. At any rate, you know, fiction Mike is writes, good. Fiction writers can be really good. <laughs> True. <laughs> Mike writes. Uh, I recently read a claim by Dr. Stephen Malthouse that quote the PCR testing is not reliable and is meaningless for diagnosing COVID nineteen, and that comes with a link to the origin of the quote. I'm immediately skeptical of the claim because it's published on the Vaccine Choice Canada website, which is an anti-vax organization. However, I'm interested to hear the TWIV panel comment on the suitability of the PCR test for diagnosing SARS-CoV-2 infection. Thank you for your time and, uh, and attention. Uh, Lou? I don't Mike. know what Lou is. <laughs> no, neither do I. Hello. <laughs> Uh, well, I haven't looked at this link, uh, but uh, I can only tell you that uh, PCR is absolutely uh, the best thing going and is very precise and quite diagnostic of a SARS-CoV-2 infection. Yes, every test has a certain amount of false positives and false negatives, but in this particular case, it's extremely low. This is a sensitive and accurate test and quite 
uh, capable of distinguishing SARS-CoV-2 from a number of other things and detecting the uh, uh, detecting the infection. So I don't know where these guys are coming from, but they are dead wrong, dead wrong. It's the way most of the infections in the world have been diagnosed. Yeah, I mean millions and millions of infections. It's specific to the genome, highly specific. It's not just used for COVID-19. It's used for many other infectious diseases. Uh, it's used in AIDS patients to monitor viral loads on a, on a monthly basis or wherever. You know, We have a whole room at Columbia with a huge machine bigger than I am that just processes uh, HIV uh, RT-PCR reactions. <clears throat> it's an amazing assay. This is just another example of what Peter Hotez was talking about. The scientific disinformation spewing from somewhere. Somebody wrote that, you know, it's not just a right. Okay, fine. Wherever it's coming from, it's not right. It's wrong. And I don't know what the point is. To bring down democracy, I don't know. But yeah, PCR is great. Actually, interestingly, at least initially, and I think to some extent uh, currently, a lot of the anti-vax stuff doesn't come from the right; comes from the left. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it does. It's uh, it's really it's Why really bizarre. What's the point of that? Uh, I uh, well, I don't. You know, it's sort of I don't understand. Oh, it. Peter it's has called who, it um, the right to my health care decision or something. like Well, that. yeah, there's the personal freedom thing, which uh, actually there's a little bit of that on both the right on and the left. Okay. Mm. Um, it's, it's odd. I don't get it, but you know, basically, uh, I think a lot of it comes from sort of, uh, uh, hip naturopathic. I don't want to put any, <laughs> any foreign things in my body, uh, culture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And I can make these decisions about what's good for me and what's not myself. And I can, uh, cook up, uh, alternative, uh, therapies and et cetera. Uh, that there's a there's a sort of a libertarian uh, uh, hue to that. Okay. <clears throat> there's a very. I'm going to get mail on that. Sorry, there, Brian. <laughs> there are there are definitely uh, <laughs> groups who are um, against what I will quote. I will quote them as saying putting something unnatural in your body. Yeah. Right. Um, which I could argue against until I'm blue in the face, but. Um, that's what they would say. And I would point out that there is only one proven homeopathic therapy in the human race, and that's vaccines. Look up homeopathy, okay? And uh, look up what it's what is supposed to be and what it's supposed to do. And uh, it's uh, vaccines aren't the absolute ultimate in the fraudulent homeopathy, but they're the closest thing that's ever been done in humans. All right. Lisa writes, hello, Vincent et al. I found you after the pandemic hit the U.S. community. I live in a suburb of Sacramento, California. I was looking for real information about the virus and particularly how it could spread if someone has no symptoms. Thank you all for so much insight. I share the podcast with anyone who needs it or would be interested. I entered a trial for the Regeneron quote vaccine in October. Uh, you don't have to put quotes. It's actually a passive vaccine. That's a terminology. You administer the products of an immune response. I'm a healthy 53-year-old woman, physically active at work. Thought I could help my country. I have not tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 ever. Oh, I love the correct terminology. Thank you. And I have now had my second round of monthly injections. These are four injections in the abdomen once per month. I find it interesting and puzzling that there are four injections in the abdomen once a month for six months. Lisa, I share your confusion, puzzle, your puzzlement or whatever. Okay, I share it. This is not rabies, right? <laughs> we got 14 inoculations in the abdomen. All right, so here are my questions for Brianne and anyone else with thoughts or ideas. One, how do, how do introducing specific antibodies into a naive individual create a durable immune response to a virus? I think I'm starting to understand how antibodies, B cells, and T cells work, but I cannot make the connection to how antibodies alone 
can elicit a response without antigen. And you are right on, and I will hand it to Brianne to tell you why. A plus, Lisa. Um, So the way that this is working is that you are getting um, a dose of antibodies with the idea that you will have them in your system for a short period of time um, to potentially block the virus should it enter. Um, But those antibodies will degrade over time because you're just getting the antibody protein. This is something called passive immunization. Um, That's probably why you need to get um, the injections once a month so that you get new antibodies because the previous ones you've received have degraded. Um, But this is not going to protect you um, after you finish um, the six-month regimen of getting these antibodies. Um, The antibodies you receive will have degraded and you will no, you will not have actually made a durable antibody response or much of any antibody response to this virus. The idea is sort of to protect you um, for a short period of time while uh, perhaps the virus is circulating um, and to stop that virus should it get into your body, but you will not be protected in a year or two or something like that. That's not how a vaccine like this works. I, I want to interject that our president got a therapy like this and claimed that he is now immune to the virus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this just shows the level of misunderstanding goes all the way to the White House. He is not long-term immune to this virus. Yes. So one of the, one of the things that was used to support the claim that he was immune was that um, he was tested after receiving this therapy and they found that he had antibodies in his blood um, against the virus. And (laughs) Um, so what that means is that he was given antibodies and then they could measure the ones they gave him um, <laughs> afterwards. And they do give a huge dose. Um, he got a particularly uh, immense dose. Um, and so it's not a shock that they could measure them in him. So uh, I want to make a, a couple of points. First of all, uh, the use of the word vaccine. Okay, which I think is where a lot of the confusion comes from. And I've had vigorous back and forth email with my buddy Ed Niles about this. Ed, I know you're listening. Okay. Uh, The word vaccine and passive vaccination is used to describe this, but in a sense, it's misleading uh, because I I think a better word is a therapy. Okay. Uh, that uh, carries the implication of it's a short-term thing. The, one of the problems is that when people hear vaccine, they think about adaptive immunity and memory, and that's not what this is, okay? Yeah. So you have to understand the subtleties in the use of the word vaccine for this. So the I think of this as a vaccine in the fact that it is prophylactic, which means that it is given before you get infected to prevent the infection. It's not something that you're getting after the infection Mm -hmm. to cure you. Um, And so in that sense, I think the use of vaccine is correct um, because it's a before uh, kind of treatment. But um, exactly as Rich said, it is not one that people think of that actually it will make your adaptive immune system do any work. And I wanted to ask uh, uh, Brianne about durability. How long, if you get a dose of an antibody from some other source, how long does it stick around? Um, I think that we usually say around two weeks. Um, He or she's getting them once a month. And I would assume that Regeneron has done some work to look at um, how quickly that antibody degrades. There may be some modifications um, that keep it around a bit longer. Um, And so in this case, a month seems to make sense to me. Um, I think it does depend a little bit on some of the specific parts of the antibody protein um, that will influence degradation. But once it's gone, it's not going to protect you from future infections. Exactly. That's that's key. Exactly. You don't have any more cells that will make more of that antibody. Okay, number two, why the abdomen? I've heard of oral and muscle vaccines, but this is weird to me. Is it because the doses are so huge it won't fit into the arm, or is it to lead the immune system to the lungs? So the abdomen has been used for rabies in the old days when you had to get 14 immunizations. They would do it in your abdomen because there's a lot of real estate there compared to your arm. Well, they don't do be. it that way anymore. Now you know, they do it into the site of the wound and into a muscle. Yeah. Um, and you don't need 14 doses anymore, I believe. 
Right. Um, now, what I believe is happening here, no, not <clears throat> it won't lead uh, the the antibodies particularly to the lungs. Regeneron wanted to know. So, this these monoclonals are typically given intravenously, which is a, a little inconvenient, right? Is now what what's being done, and and Lily also has uh, a monoclonal, a set of monoclonals for preventing SARS-CoV-2 infection. Uh, they're setting up transfusion centers across the country with beds. You go in and you have to lie down and it takes an hour to transfuse this into your vein. Then they wait an hour to make sure you don't have any reactions and then you go. This is a big deal as opposed to, you know, getting an injection. So they tried to see if, uh, I think they're doing it sub-Q in the, in the abdomen, if I'm not mistaken. That's what I heard through Daniel Griffin. I could be wrong. Uh, my understanding is it didn't work. To do it that way, you need to do it intravenously. Um, and I think that the multiple immunizations were a, a way of saying, can we do this, you know, every month? Because as being said, it goes away after a certain amount of time. That's my understanding. And also, I'm not really sure. The effectiveness should decrease potentially because of antibodies that the that Lisa in this case, or that the person receiving this, that their own body is going to make against this foreign protein of the antibody that's introduced. Yes, exactly. Um, the the Regeneron antibody um, has a lot of modifications um, to be really similar or as similar as possible to the human antibody. Um, so this is the one that was made in the Velocimune mice. Um, so they're human, they're human antibodies, basically. Yeah, right? they're human yeah. antibodies that are coming in. But the combining site is going to be antigenic, right? Yes. Anti-idiotypes. <laughs> Took me so long to, to get that in, in grad school. <laughs> uh, every time you say it, I'm impressed. <laughs> when I was a student, this was a big deal. And yes. um, yeah. people used to make antibodies to ligands by immunizing against the receptor, right? And it's really hard to wrap your head around. And part of the problem was they never explained it well because they used these words like idiot type. And they, right. what? <laughs> no, I'm not an idiot, but you don't get All right. So why so much per round? Four injections seems like a ton. Would anyone really say, yeah, I want that one? Yeah, four injections in your belly does not seem like a, a broadly uh, acceptable thing to me. I agree. And so- uh, I think, you know, an intravenous, one intravenous inoculation, uh, uh, again, you know, you have to repeat it. That's the problem with monoclonal therapy. It's not great. Yeah. They're Once giving again, a huge dose here, too. Yeah, yeah milligrams, Once right? Once again, the, the, yes, uh, uh, grams. Grams, grams. Like yeah. eight grams. I think the, <laughs> the for some reason, I have the number 2.6 in my head. I think the president got eight grams, and I think the normal dose was 2.6 yeah. is what I had read. Right. And the deal is, in a, as opposed to a real vaccine where you're inducing the body to do something, in this particular case, uh, every uh, every part, the, the whole therapy is getting the concentration of this reagent in your blood up to an effective concentration. It takes a lot. Let me just take a brief moment here and, and see if I can find um, the the actual clinical trial that she's talking about. Well, I do you recall do? I do recall in a clinical trial the uh, sub Q being uh, mentioned as the uh, root of administration, and that confused the heck out of me because I'm used to sub Q as a little bubble of like 50 microliters between the epidermis into the dermis. Okay, but this, uh, if this is, if sub Q actually means shooting it past the skin into the abdomen, that makes a little more sense, but I'm not sure that that's correct. Yeah, I mean, is that IP almost at some point? <laughs> no, yeah. uh, it sounds I don't think like it to me. I don't think they're doing IP. Let me see. No, here it is. It's the clinical trial, um, Subcutaneous immunogenic blah 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 repeated subcutaneous doses of this mixture of two monoclonal antibodies in adult volunteers sub Q every four weeks. Um, so I don't know exactly what sub Q means in that context. Well, so if they're doing sub Q the way that we do sub Q in mice, they're you pulling up some tissue and then you're injecting into that portion of it and. 
So while it may seem like it's in the belly, it's maybe sub Q of the abdomen region. But Under eight, the skin. Eight <laughs> yeah. grams? I mean, can you imagine the volume? Yeah. How do you do that? So something weird's going on. I wanted to make a point that um, if you get this kind of treatment and you get the virus, if the treatment is effective, your immune system will not make a response to the virus. So again, for the president to say he's immune, it would, you know, we would need to have someone go and test him later to see if the virus hung around long enough for him to make an immune response to that. And just another aside, I don't know if this came up at all in the Sally Permar immune. I haven't had time to listen to it yet, but um, another form of passive immunization that happens naturally is from the mother to the unborn child. And uh, so that is a reason why there are certain vaccines that you don't give right away because the maternal antibody is already there and present. And when that maternal antibody wanes is then when you want to do an immunization so that the newborn will raise their own antibodies and have memory. Yes. And, and to make that, it at, go ahead. I was just going to say in that case, um, I think those antibodies are persisting a bit longer than a couple of weeks. Um, but there's also a much larger dose um, <laughs> after nine months of pregnancy, as opposed to um, one shot um, that you received for some kind of therapy. And to make to make it absolutely clear, a lot of that maternal antibody comes through the milk. So nursing is good. All right. Some through the placenta, some through the milk. For, uh, I have not had a single reaction to the two rounds I have received. So I was thinking I am in the placebo group. However, since it's just an antibody cocktail, could it be that antibodies alone would not bring on any aches, pains, or fever? So yes, it's not a, it's not adjuvanted. It's not going to induce an inflammatory response. Although I would think it could do something, you know, grams of anything <laughs> could do something, right, Brianne? <laughs> Yeah, um, I think that the injection of grams of something um, could give you a little bit of uh, some discomfort, yeah. uh, but I don't think you would get the sort of general aches, pains, and fever um, that and, uh, she's thinking of here. What would be the draining lymph nodes that she could have looked for adenopathy? In the groin? That's what I was thinking. I don't maybe. know if it's the groin or... If it's something more internal like that you would Like the mesenteric. Yeah, yeah, the mesenteric, you'd never be able to... Feel right, right, right. Oh, no. well, thank you for your thoughts and response once again. I really appreciate you all, and don't miss an episode. P.S. Three hours is long, but in my work, I fit it in. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Best regards, Lisa. Is she works in pet waste management? Yeah. <laughs> huh. Yeah. I'm looking this up. The scoop pest waste management. What do you do in that kind of work? Like what kind of uh, pet? I, I manage my own dog's waste. <laughs> well, not every, not everybody is res, as responsible uh, as you. Or, you know, maybe they sell the little shovels or uh, okay. the bags or... Or cat litter. <laughs> or maybe they service larger things like humane societies or who knows. All right. Uh, looks, uh, from the internet, it looks like there are whole industries in uh, doing this. Right. So you would uh, maybe on patrol have uh, plenty of time to listen to Twiv. Perhaps I can imagine dog walking, you know, you could, you could have a lot of, all right, let's go to some picks because these next letters are long. So we can't do another round. It'll be three hours long <laughs> <laughs> and people will complain. And so, and by the way, um, I just, you know, a number of people complained about three hours. So, you know, I peeled off Daniel and Daniel laughed. He goes, yeah, if you put chapters in books, they're easier to read. <laughs> 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 and so then I looked at Joe Rogan. He's a podcast. He's supposedly the most popular podcaster on earth. You just go look at his podcast. Two to three hours plus 10 to 20 million downloads per podcast. So if you're saying you're happy to hear... Kanye West talked with Joe for three plus hours and not viruses. Okay, I get it. <laughs> Frankly, I I wouldn't do that, but uh, some people can, millions of people can listen to three hour podcasts. I know listen, learning is hard. I get it. We're trying to help. Let's do some picks. 
<laughs> Brianne, what do you have for us? Um, so I have uh, a sort of a site, but it's, I'll explain in a second, called Pedromics. Um, these are some comics that are made uh, by a, a scientist named Pedro Valicia. Uh, I've given the link to his uh, comic page on Facebook, but he actually has one on Twitter and on Instagram and sort of on all sorts of places. He has a Redbubble shop. And so you can find Pedromics on a number of different um, types of sites. And he has a lot of science-based cartoons and he drew a cartoon um, I saw for the first time yesterday um, that I really enjoyed. Um, his title is Ribosomes Getting the Job Done Since 4 Billion BC. <laughs> um, and it shows a ribosome um, translating an mRNA um, saying another job done, well done, what's next? Um, and his, his friend ribosome saying, Nigel, I don't think that one came from the nucleus. And I'm saying, well, a job is a job. On we go. And then we see a doctor um, who's given a shot who says, and that's your RNA vaccine. Um, so thinking about how the mRNA vaccine gets uh, gets translated. Um, he has a lot of really funny um, science and sort of biomedical science related comics that I get a kick out of. I show in my lectures pretty often. I cool. had seen I had seen previously this one that I really like. Beta mercaptoethanol, ma masking lab flatulence since 1956. <laughs> That's yes. excellent. Yes, he has a lot that are really, really good. Kathy, cool. Kathy, what do you have for us? Uh, I picked a site, uh, that another astronomy picture of the day. This one is the global map of Mars at opposition. And uh, it's been a while since I uh, this came out. It was November 20th. And uh, it's just this really cool... Uh, image of the opposition of Mars image was captured by a team over six long nights at Peak du Midi mountaintop observatory uh, when the fourth rock from the sun had not wandered far from its 2020 opposition and its biggest and brightest appearance in the Earth's night sky. So um, they have uh, two or three different versions, the still version that's on the site itself. And then if you click in the caption down below, there's a rotating sphere version and rotating stereo views, which are just phenomenal. So uh, they're just really worth taking a look at. Uh, and so that's, that's all cool. there is to that. That's a pretty yeah. neat image. Yeah. Rich, what do you have for us? Listeners will understand that there are gaping holes in my understanding of immunology. <laughs> and I have now dedicated myself to filling those holes. I had some correspondence with Brianne about how I could educate myself and uh, came down on uh, Janeway's Immunobiology, a textbook. So that's my pick. is a textbook, Janeway's Immunobiology by... Uh, Kenneth Murphy and Casey Weaver. It's called Janeway's to honor the original uh, author, Charles Janeway. It's been uh, out since the mid nineties. Uh, and I am proud to say that I am now uh, all the way through the immunity section and I'm working on um, a structure of uh, various uh, molecules, uh, T cell receptors and et cetera. And it's <laughs> just going to show you how much of a nerd I am. It's riveting. <laughs> <laughs> Among other things, because I, you know, I'm familiar with the players, okay, and I have a lot of questions, and so it's like reading a mystery because I'm going to get the answer by the time this is over. Yes, so, so uh, I will mention um, I I love the Janeway book. Um, it is definitely my favorite immunology book. Um, for listeners who don't have as much um, sort of background in molecular and cellular biology as rich. Um, there are a few, it might not be the one I would recommend first. It's not the one I use for my undergraduates. Um, but one thing that's actually really nice is there's another linked textbook um, called The Immune System by Peter Parham um, that uses the same figures, um, but as at a somewhat simpler level. Um, and so um, if you don't have the level of background that Rich has um, and you want um, something a little more basic, you can still get a lot of the great benefit of Janeway um, in an, another uh, lower level. Yeah, I, thanks, Brianne. I appreciate that because I was, I was, I was going to say that uh, you can't read this without a good grounding in yep. 
cell and molecular biology uh, and, and biochemistry. Uh, and also one of the things that's really great about it is the figures. The figures are just awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other day on Immune, Cindy had a similar sentiment about Janeway for beginners. Yeah, she thought it would be too hard. Yeah. Yeah, but it's still, to me, it's sort of the best one yeah. out there. And it's certainly my favorite. Um, Another one we've talked about that's even simpler and is not a textbook, mm. it's about a quarter inch thick, is How the Immune System Works yep. by Lauren Samparak. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I always think for any of these that, I mean, if you just started with Janeway, where do you start in immunology? You have to have <laughs> some idea that yeah. there's T cells and B cells and antibodies and so forth. And if you, yeah, it, it would just be really hard to start without some knowledge. And so uh, I think that's where Lauren's book could, could get you going. And then if you really want a hardcore uh, textbook type thing, then these two that Brianne has mentioned and Rich picked. One of them. Janeway actually has an introductory chapter or section, I forget, uh, that does the whole thing, okay? okay, and introduces you to all the terms. But still, you know, it would uh, it, it would be a real struggle without some background. So these simpler texts for those who are totally naive to the science would be better. Yes, and I, I will also uh, second uh, that I am aware of how much Rich has been enjoying uh, Janeway. He sent me some messages, and every time, every time I get a big smile on my face, hearing how much Rich has been enjoying. Well, you and I are going to have to have our own little uh, chat with an immunologist when this is over, because I'm not even going to. I've identified now what the biggest gap is. Okay. Okay. And I'm not even going to tell you what it is. All right. Okay? Well, I and I am I ready. I better get it answered. When, okay. Whenever you want, I am ready. In fact, with one of our other um, earlier letters, I had a place where I was going to give you an immunology quiz, but I also thought that <laughs> better. To oh, actually, I was thinking about this today because I was anticipating this uh, chat with an immunologist when I'm done figuring it'll be my final exam. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yes, my, my pick is uh, Janet Iwasa's animation lab at the University of Utah. I was on a Zoom thing yesterday with Carleton College. So this is University of Utah, Wes Sunquist and Janet and, other, and and Nels. They're teaching an externship to Carleton. So Carleton is in Minnesota. That's actually where Nels went to college. And so this is called the Carleton Externship. So they're people in Utah are running a course and they get – guest speakers in. So they had me come in and Janet to talk about science communication. So Janet talked and, you know, she's an um, amazing animator who I've known for many years. And we're going to get her on Twiv to talk about this because it's a cool story. She's actually someone who has a job doing science communication at the university level. Her university made a position for her. They adjusted the tenure rules because she doesn't do research. She doesn't do bench research. She makes animations. And this website is uh, some of that really nice animations. And um, I, I hand it to University of Utah for doing this. You know, So she was a PhD student. She got interested in animation. Her PI let her go and take a course using Maya, the animation software. She got a postdoc with Jack Shostak, you know, hardcore scientist, the trainer of Jennifer Doudna, among others. And he, she said, I want to come and work with you and do animations of your research. She said, sure. Now, this is, you know, not something that everyone would do. She got a fellowship to do it. She animated his stuff is the origin of life. She animated it. She did a museum exhibit. And then she ended up at Utah as a job, a faculty. And now she has postdocs learning animation in her lab. So this is cool. This yeah. is what every university Very should cool. have, not just yeah, one. Yeah. Awesome. You know, you, you don't just need to get grants and do research and publish papers and, and luxury journals. You should be able to do some kind of communicating like this. Anyway, her animations are beautiful. Animation Lab will help you explore it. And we will have her on. Uh, in on Twiv in a couple of weeks, so uh, because I had never met her, and actually, um, now that you, you got this connection, hey, come on, Twiv. Okay, um, Cheryl writes this is a listener pick. Well, most of 2020 may have sucked. <laughs> there have been some incredible silver linings. My favorite is getting to know all of you. Well, thank you. That's very nice. 
My weekly science pick is biorender.com's new holiday card templates. I forgot to put the picture in that she sent. Why didn't I do that? Let me put it in now, uh, which I've used to make the enclosed card for you. I hope you'll be able to enjoy some fun extra follicular activities this winter. <laughs> That's great. Fondly, Cheryl in New Hampshire, where it is a devastating 55F13C on December 1st as my skis wait patiently uh, at the door. So let me uh, put the image in right here as we speak, because I'm pretty sure I um, I downloaded it uh, right here. Here we go. Twiv Biomoji Snowball Fight e-card. <laughs> this is very funny. <laughs> to the Twiv team from Cheryl in New Hampshire. I like that. Isn't oh, it cute? Really cool. <laughs> Created that's in BioRender.com. Have you ever used BioRender, uh, Brienne? I love BioRender. Um, I use BioRender to make lots of figures, um, and I find it to be an incredibly useful site. It's I think cute. I picked it once. You yes, might have, yeah. I think you did, yeah. And Kathy has a listener pick for us. Sure, this is from Greg. Uh, he sent it to me. Uh, if you want, and you're only watching the YouTubes, then you just need to listen to the very end of the show, and Vincent will tell you how you can send them directly to Twiv. But this worked also. And so he sent something that came out in April, and uh, it's the ultimate in earworms. It's a parody of Nessun Dorma, entitled No Corona by Daniel Emmett, and he does all the parts. Um, <laughs> and so uh, just in case you didn't know, Nessun Dorma is an aria from the final act of Puccini's opera Turandot, and it's one of the best-known tenor arias in all of opera. So uh, if you uh, want to hear this, it's not very long, but definitely well worth listening to, called No Corona. What was the one the other day? The other opera oh, parody? Um, yeah, and it's a it's a long one, uh, uh, which I haven't managed to look at yet. COVID but, fan tutte. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Nessun dorma. Yeah. Yeah, I grew up with opera in, my, in this family. It's cool. My, I, my, I have a funny story about this. I was at um, a party with a bunch of music teachers that... Um, and uh, voice teachers, and they were talking about how every now and then they'll get an adult male starting to take voice lessons and they want to sing this aria. Mm. And they just, they were just kind of mocking this and rolling their eyes because it's not easy. And somebody just starting out as an adult uh, is probably not going to really do a, a decent job of it, mm. but it is quite famous and it. Every, most people know it. You'll recognize it. My, my, uh, one of our sons, our youngest son, Devin, he, uh, when he was, I don't know, six, seven, he took opera lessons for six months. Hmm. Opera singing. He went to mm -hmm. a local person's house and the guy said he has a lot of talent. Of course, his voice was high, so he could do cool things back then. And anyway, mm -hmm. he, he recorded, um, a little thing on and it's on YouTube. It is so cool to hear him knock this out, you know, for a little guy, he does a really good job and he stopped. Unfortunately, he could have been a contender, but <laughs> <laughs> I have to send you guys the link because yes, yeah, it, is so, it really puts chills in me because this little guy belting out and he's really animated. The guy did a good job teaching him in just six months, you know, it was fantastic. Too bad he didn't continue. All right, that is Twiv, Twiv 688. By the way, folks, because now we're splitting Daniel off <laughs> into his own episodes, we hit 700 before the end of 2020. It's actually the <laughs> last episode of 2020, I think. Yeah, it's number 700. That's pretty cool. We did 100 this year. More, yeah, actually. More than 100. <laughs> Phew, twiv688, microbe.tv slash twiv, uh, questions and comments, twiv at microbe.tv. And if you'd like to support us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Alan Dove is not here. <laughs> <laughs> Rich Condit's an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He's currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. I don't know why I thought of Alan Dove, you know, it's weird. Brian Barker's at Drew University, Bioprof 
Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Kathy Spindler's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.